an 11-year-old girl is rushed to hospital after being struck by a bus outside her school in Mississauga. We're going to have the latest on this developing story. Taking out bike lanes in Toronto, the Ford government is getting ready to remove sections of not just Bloor, but Young and University lanes. We'll have reaction tonight. And get ready, T-Swift is coming to the 6. We'll tell you all about the city's elaborate plans. And it is an unseasonably warm Halloween. Nothing frightening about that. We'll tell you how to keep trick-or-treaters safe and having fun coming up. That is spooky, though. You're watching Live at 5. <laughs> Hello, I'm Andrew Brennan. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thank you for joining us here on Live at 5. We begin with a developing story tonight. A child has been rushed to hospital after being struck by a transit bus outside of a middle school in Mississauga. And Chopper 24 was over the scene at Liscar Middle School today. That's near 9th Line and Derry Road with paramedics telling us this 11-year-old girl was rushed to sick kids in critical condition. Now, the driver of the My Way bus, we're told, remained on scene. And we are following developing news out of Queen's Park this hour. The Ford government is getting ready to begin removing sections of bike lanes from Bloor, Young and University Avenue. And for the latest, we're joined in studio by our own Lindsay Biscaya, breaking down what we know and also reaction, Lindsay. Yeah, and of course, as I'm sure you can both imagine, we're getting a lot of reaction uh, from this. This has been a very contentious issue for maybe years, but really in the last month or so, it has wrapped up, uh, ramped up rather, and that's uh, ever since the provincial government has introduced that legislation that would basically uh, require municipalities to get permission from the province uh, to build bike lanes that would interfere with traffic for vehicles, and the province would also ha now have permission to look back on biking infrastructure, cycling infrastructure that was built in the last five years and deem whether to remove it or not if it does, in fact, uh, interfere with vehicle lanes of traffic. And the province says this is all in an effort to reduce congestion. But now the latest today is that we know the Ford government has actually begun the process of removing bike lanes on sections of Bloor, Young and University, so some of the main routes. Uh, and we are getting a lot of reaction from this, of course, because many cyclists and cyclist advocates will argue that if you build better bike lanes, you actually will get more traffic off the roads because people will have other options other than just using cars. Uh, we did speak with David Shelnut, founder of the Biking Lawyer LLP today, who says that this is more of a political mood from the government rather than something practical. Have a listen. It's to us a big distraction why a provincial government is focused uh, about a bike lane on Yonge Street. Uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, it's not something that, that they're responsible for. Uh, you know, if we want to talk congestion, gridlock, you know, we can, anybody who drives in the city of Toronto knows that's caused by construction. Uh, but, but, hey, construction has to happen, so let's work with it. But uh, if we're really talking about congestion in the GTHA, that has provincial responsibility is the 401. Go see my mom in Guelph all the time, and it's madness to get there. Uh, so we have been looking for comment from the province today. I have not received that yet for an actual interview with uh, the Minister of Transportation, but we do have a tweet from the Premier, Doug Ford, and we'll bring that up for you so you can see it now. I'll read it to you as well. It says, bike lanes being on secondary streets, not belong on secondary streets, rather, not clogging traffic on main roads. It's time to get you moving again. So that's kind of the aim here, is the province says bike lanes should be on secondary avenues instead of those main roads, such as Bloor and University. And Lena and Andrew, as I mentioned, we have reached out to the Minister of Transportation for comment. Uh, his office declined to comment today, but we do know he's going to be taking questions from reporters tomorrow, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about this. Mm -hmm. Sure, you. there will be. Thanks very much, Lindsay Biscaya, reporting in studio. Thanks, Lindsay. Now, the province's police watchdog investigating after a 17-year-old boy died in an exchange of gunfire with York police in Aurora last night. And for more on that, we're joined live by our crime analyst, Steve Ryan, tonight. Steve, what's the latest? Well, we know that uh, this happened on Downey Circle, which is about five minutes north of York Regional Police Headquarters, which is where we are right now, and uh, residents describe it as a quiet residential street. And according to the Special Investigations Unit, uh, York Regional Police responded to a break and enter in progress yesterday evening at 7.30 p.m. When they arrived on scene, they were confronted by a 17-year-old male who was armed. There was an exchange of gunfire between that 17-year-old and the police. 
and that 17-year-old uh, died as a result of the uh, a gunfight. Now, I did have a chance to listen to uh, an audio of a surveillance tape that was captured in the area last night, and you could hear multiple uh, gunshots uh, in the background. And uh, as a result, there were over 90 evidence markers on the ground this morning when we were out at the scene. And the SAU has invoked their mandate, of course, because uh, their mandate is required to be invoked when there is a serious bodily injury or death to a civilian who has an interaction with the police. And their job now will be to critique the actions of the police to see if, in fact, they were justified under the law in using the lethal force that they did, which resulted in the 17-year-old losing his life. Here's more from the Special Investigations Unit and from a resident who we heard from as well. Here's more from both of them. An individual contacted police to report a break and enter in progress at a residence on Downey Circle. Soon after officers arrived at the scene from York Regional Police, there was an exchange of gunfire between the 17-year-old male and four police officers. The male was struck multiple times and pronounced deceased at the scene. One officer suffered minor injuries and was taken to hospital for treatment. We heard three bangs outside um, that my mother immediately thought was gunshot. My father and I were like, there's no way that could possibly happen here. Um, we've lived our entire lives. And um, we went uh, to go open the front door and saw police cars outside. So we closed the door immediately and went upstairs. Um, we were looking out briefly. And after those three bangs, I, I personally did not hear anything after that for a little bit um, until I saw cops um, outside. Um, I heard more gunshots from up the street echoing somewhere. Um, and then cops uh, had pulled out guns and started shooting. On one of the driveways between evidence markers 92 and 93 uh, was a shotgun. So the fact you guys. All right, Steve Ryan reporting live from Aurora tonight. Steve, thanks so much for this. Well, a young mother has been charged in a West End fire that left her baby dead. The early morning fire began around 4 a.m. We're told police say a four-month-old girl was pulled from the home and rushed to hospital. She was pronounced dead. Now, the girl's mother was seriously injured as well, but survived. 19-year-old Catherine Quitta Batugo is charged with second-degree murder and arson with disregard for human life. And York Regional Police have charged a woman in the death of a six-year-old boy in Vaughan. Police say the boy was fatally struck by a school bus on the morning of June 19th. It happened in the area of Kleinberg Summit Way and Pierre Burton Boulevard. A York Regional Police now say a 65-year-old woman from Vaughan is charged with dangerous operation causing death. Well, it's always a good time to check on traffic, especially do we get a trick or do we get a treat? Let's find out with Adrian C.A. <laughs> of Bois. Ooh, it's a I little bit of both. I think I know what she's going to say. You oh, know, okay. we, don't have, we don't have any uh, tricks. No real treats either. It's slow, so, but no pesky issues. If you're trying to make your way home, I'll probably get your trick-or-treaters ready to get them out on the streets and get all that candy. But... In the meantime, if you're trying to get home, it's going to take you a while. Uh, just on the Don Valley Parkway North, it's really, really busy as you make your way from Bayview Bloor and you continue up towards the uh, 401. On the 401, all earlier issues have cleared, but uh, the traffic volumes have not eased off. It's still very jammed across the top of the city. And into Vaughn, just had a peak. Northbound of 400, both core and collectors, pretty busy from Highway 7. It eases off past Major Mac. We are dealing with a little bit of a trick outside of camera view. If you're headed further north on the 400 up at Town Line Road, crews dealing with the collision it's in the left lane this cp24 traffic report is brought to you by 407 etr enjoy the journey with a stress-free commute one person was arrested following a crash involving a ttc bus in north york that left a number of people injured a pickup truck we're told collided with a bus near finch and young around 4 30 a.m eight people in all were injured including both drivers and six passengers on the bus in all, six of eight were taken to hospital, including three with serious injuries. Police say the driver of the truck took off on foot, but was taken into custody after a brief pursuit. I heard a big explosion, like a bang. I swear to God, I thought it was uh, like a motorcycle. So I ran across the street. Uh, the bus driver was in shock. I saw another woman with blood all over her. I looked at the guy like, oh, where's the guy? I thought the guy was dead. When I walked across, like maybe a couple of feet, it was a SUV. The guy was outside and started. Uh, he actually looked like he had blood all over him. 
but he just looked like he was just out of it. I told him to sit down. He didn't listen to me like he was up to something. Next thing I know, I saw the guy run. The driver of the truck was taken to hospital after being arrested. There's no word on what, if any, charges have been laid yet. The TTC says it is assisting police with the investigation into this crash. It's 510, 22 degrees, and you're watching Live at 5. Well, the city of Toronto unveils how it's going to welcome Swifties from around the world in November. We're going to have those details next. Welcome back. The city unveiling today how it's going to be preparing for Swifty Mania. Yeah. <laughs> Taylor Swift's Eras Tour is coming to town. Did you not know about that yet? Yeah. Well, surprise. Yeah, okay. It's happening in Toronto next month. If this is news to you, I mean, how could it be? Uh, CB24's Beatrice Vaisman joins us live with the very latest. Uh, it takes a lot of work to plan something like this, Beatrice, as you're learning. Yeah, no kidding. When 500,000 Swifties are coming to town in a matter of two weeks, you got to make sure that all of your planning is done, that people are going to be safe, that they're going to have a good time, and that they can still somehow navigate around the city. I mean, traffic, we know, is brutal in the best of days, never mind when there's such an influx of people here. And that's why the city says it's put taken a year to put a plan together to make sure everything goes as smoothly as possible. Here's more from the manager of transportation services for the city. We have our traffic agents, we'll have traffic control personnel, um, and then also understanding uh, the timings of when people are going to be coming in and out and giving ourselves sufficient time to manage around that. Um, we've also learned from a number of other cities, including Miami and Seattle and, and a number of others who were really helpful in early planning stages of sort of giving us an update on the flow of these events and what we can expect that was unusual or uh, different from many other large events that they've managed. And learning from other cities has really been key to this. I mean, Toronto is obviously no stranger to big events. We had Beyonce here last year, the Raptors 2019 parade, where we saw hundreds of thousands of people on the streets of Toronto. All of those have been learning experiences for city officials. What they've done this time, you heard Barbara Gray talk about traffic controls and traffic agents and volunteers that have been hired, Toronto police officers that are going to be out on patrol across the city. They've created limited zones. So between King and Queen's Key, uh, from Bathurst out to Jarvis, there's going to be construction halted while Taylor Swift is here from the 14th to the 23rd. Uh, and then there's an even smaller red zone that they're calling in the periphery of the Rogers Centre uh, because they know that people are going to have a tough time getting around. It's going to be reserved only for people who live and work in the area. As for Toronto police, uh, certainly things changed when back in August there was a terror attack that was thwarted at a Taylor Swift concert out in Vienna, Austria. And so Toronto police say they've been working with other agencies, not only across the country, but across the world to really find out how to navigate this best. So they maintain there's been no threat to the Toronto Taylor Swift concerts. Here's what we heard from the deputy police chief, Lauren Polk. With any event, any event, large scale event where there's a lot of people, our considerations are always uh, around um, public safety. I mean, that is our priority as a policing organization. And uh, certainly working with our intelligence partners as part of that, um, you know, we are continuously monitoring any potential threats. Uh, there are no th no threats at this time, and uh, we are adequately resourced and again well integrated with all of our partners to respond accordingly. The City of Toronto is also going to have its emergency uh, services centre operations up and running. They can pivot at a moment's notice, they say, and, and change gears if they need to. But ultimately, they're hoping that this concert series, these six sold-out shows, go off without a hitch, that Taylor Swift hands have a great time, they have fun, and they're also hoping they spend big time, because it's supposed to add some hundreds of millions of dollars to our GDP. In fact, per person, the city expecting these fans to spend roughly $1,300 hundred dollars which means a lot of cash flowing into Toronto's economy back to you guys Beatrice Vaisman reporting <laughs> live for us so I know Taylor Swift's favorite color is red so I'm figuring that Toronto's oh, probably yeah. now is green thirteen hundred dollars a person not bad Ooh, yeah 516 23 degrees you're watching live at five the Ford government is expanding alcohol sales to big box stores today we'll tell you the details next I'm buying right out of their shop there great Ontario company Welcome back. All grocery stores, convenience stores, and big box stores can now sell beer, wine, cider, 
and ready to drink cocktails. Mm -hmm. The Premier and his finance minister were at a Costco early today showing the expansion plan quite literally in their hands. The final step of this expansion now brings big box stores into the fold, allowing them to sell larger than six pack packs of alcohol. Now, the Premier was also asked today by, reporter, by reporters about the province missing housing targets once again this year. Well, it's still, it's still a number of years away, right? We, we don't control interest rates. Once interest rates drop again and uh, people have an opportunity to go out there and maybe put a deposit down on a condo or a townhome or a house, um, I'm, I'm confident. But I asked the municipalities right back at them. There's some municipalities that want to build. There's other municipalities, and, and by the way, they, they get the, the funds. We call it the BFF fund, um, Building Faster Fund. There's other municipalities just won't build. The Ontario Liberal Party has called out the Ford government for declining housing starts outlined in the fall economic statement. The writing has been on the wall year after year. Their projections have been coming down uh, and they've been trying to revise definitions. You know, when they realized that they couldn't credibly build or, or even pretend to build the homes that they promised to, they changed the definition and said, we're going to throw in dormitory beds and long-term care beds to try and stack the cards and, and, and bulk up the numbers. Um, am I surprised at the repeated year-over-year -year failures? Unfortunately not. Now, according to the fall economic statement, the Ford government expects just over 81,000 homes to be built this year, well short of the 125,000 home annual target to reach 1.5 million homes built by 2031. It is 520, 23 degrees, and you're watching live at 5. Well, this is Halloween. This is, you have to do it along to the music. Oh, okay, okay, this okay. is Halloween, 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 Halloween. Can you tell Andrew wrote that through? Yeah, just to see anyone if they were surprised, you or not. Okay, we're going to go to the best place to get trick-or-treats, or maybe. That just looks terrifying. We're coming back in a minute. Stay with us. Well, Halloween is here, the spookiest night of the year, of course. Spookiest <laughs> night of the year. Thousands, much better, much better. I gotta practice that. Thousands of kids in costumes are getting ready for a night of trick or treating. Almost time. And Sija Lou is in Easter. Oh Ooh, my! Okay, that's God. not Sija. I hope. Uh, so I don't think Cija? that's Sija. Sija, what happened? Do we have to break a curse? That's not me, but this <laughs> is my good friend Crouchy. The butcher, if you want some candy here in East York, you're going to have to get past him. You're going to have to be brave enough. Come past this spooky yard before you get your treat. I am here in East York on Browning Avenue. I'm being told this is one of the best streets to go trick-or-treating. People come all across the GTA to come to this home. And we have been walking around. This is by far the spookiest home. I'm here with Erica. She is the mastermind behind this masterpiece. Uh, take us through some of these decorations and creepy uh, things in your yard. Yeah, for sure. So first we have the Phantom, which is seven feet tall, and he's the guy at the back. Then we have the Trio of Clouds, which is new this year. Then we, of course, have the famous Crouchy. And as you go through, we have uh, right here is a graveyard with some of the severed legs, and then the big spider. And then at the end, we actually have a poltergeist that we've put up there as well. Wow, I love that you went all out. How much effort went into putting this together? You know, it's it's been an effort over a couple of years now. So we started about four years ago. We add a new piece every year just to have a little bit more fun and make sure that the kids aren't seeing the same thing year after year. And I can imagine this will be very spooky once the sun sets. Give us a preview of what kids might be feeling. Well, I think they feel scared, but first and foremost, uh, I mean, one thing that we do is we have the smoke machines going, and then we also have strobe lights. So sometimes when you come up, kids will get really scared, mainly of the clouds and crouchy, which is understandable. And how are you feeling about the weather this year? I mean, it's what, 21 degrees right now? Unreal. It's amazing. And honestly, it's better for the decorations as well because we don't have to dry them out before we put them away. And it's also great for costumes. I have some kids here. Uh, we know Taylor Swift is in town. We actually have her boyfriend here, Travis Kelsey, his brother. How are you guys doing? Uh, give us your best impersonation. Hey, I'm Jason. <laughs> you gotta fight for your right. <laughs> 
The party! That's, that's it. Very nice. So, uh, what do we have here? What are you guys dressed up as? Killers. Yeah, killers. Yeah. All right. Well, wonderful costumes, so realistic. Uh, we'll send it back to you guys for now, but as you can see, trick-or-treating off to a great start already. That was a pretty uh, great impression. That was speechless. pretty great. We, he, need to, he needs to never fight for his right for candy ever again. I think he just won Halloween. Mm -hmm. All right, CJ, thanks so much for this. Uh, Halloween is a day to celebrate, of course, at the College of Makeup, Art, and Design downtown. It's, it's a great day to be creative. Absolutely. The mm -hmm. College on Lombard Street throwing a party this afternoon with staff and sh students showing off their many, many uh, skills. It all led to the creation of a wide cast of characters. Yeah, today is certainly definitely a, a jacked up day at CMU being Halloween. We look forward to it every year. But you will see this level of creativity every day from our instructors and from our students, which is what's really exciting. The great thing is that today in the school you have students who are studying hairstyling, fashion photographic makeup, creature design, and theatrical makeup. And regardless of what time in the program that they're at, they all still gave it their all and became really creative with their makeup looks, and that's what we love. And here at CMU, we really like go for it. You will see things for Christmas, you will see things for, for Easter, but Halloween is the, is the spooky season, is the funniest, is the best. Now, not to be outdone when it comes to what is the best, the Halloween decorations outside of one home near High Park is mm -hmm. drawing a lot of attention and maybe, maybe causing some nightmares. Yeah, this is not for the faint of the heart. The, this home right here, take a look, uh, on the corner of Glen Lake Avenue and Dorval Road, has zombies, werewolves, spiders, ghosts, and all kinds of skeletons. Personally, clowns are terrifying for me. Yeah, not down with clowns. So there's even a creepy clown there and Frankenstein. You could see the clown, that yeah. thing's terrifying. <laughs> it's so scary. Uh, there is a good cause behind all this horror though. The homeowners are using the extra attention to collect donations for the Daily Bread Food Bank. That's really nice, but also terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> and we got the Vincent Price laugh at the best time there. <gasps> Students across the city getting into a spooky mood today. They got to wear their costumes, of course, to school. Yeah, hundreds of students from Oriel Park Junior Public School participated in a parade around the neighborhood this morning. They also had a pumpkin patch filled with decorated pumpkins from each class and a food drive to benefit the local food bank. So horror meets really good cause. Can't go wrong. No, like not that. at all. <laughs> 5, 28, 23 degrees. You're watching Toronto's breaking new CP24. This is live at 5. The Ford government prepares to begin removing sections of bike lanes from three major streets in Toronto. We're going to walk you through what's changing and have reactions. Stay with us. An 11 year old girl rushed to hospital, struck by a bus outside of her school in Mississauga. We're going to have the latest on this developing story coming up. And ripping out bike lanes in Toronto, the Ford government gets ready to remove sections of the lanes from Bloor, Young, and University. We're going to have lots of reaction on that tonight. And get ready. Toronto's not going to hate, hate, hate when Taylor Swift comes to town. We'll tell you all about the city's elaborate plans. And the spookiest night of the year is finally here. The kids are just about to start trick-or-treating. We're going to have everything you need to know to keep your little ones safe. This is Live at Five. Good evening and thank you for joining us. I'm Lena Latifat. And I'm Andrew Brennan. Welcome to Live at Five. A child has been rushed to hospital after being struck by a transit bus outside of a middle school in Mississauga. Yeah, we're giving you live shots from Chopper 24 here. Chopper 24 was over the scene at Lisgar Middle School near Ninth Line and Dairy Road. Paramedics telling CB24 the 11-year-old girl was rushed to sick kids in critical condition. The driver of the My Way bus remained at the scene. And for an update, we are joined live now by Constable Tyler Belmorena with the Peel Regional Police. Tyler, we always appreciate your help. What can you tell us about what transpired today and if we have any update on the condition of this little girl? Certainly. At approximately 2.30 this afternoon, we responded to uh, Lisgar Street out front of Lisgar Middle School for reports of a child struck by a Mississauga transit bus, as you mentioned. Uh, she's been transported to hospital in life-threatening condition. An update that I received uh, a, a few moments ago is that arrangements are being made to have her transported uh, to Sick Kids Hospital, where she'll get the, uh, the best care. Uh, but as of right now, I'm pleased to report that she's in stable condition. 
Okay, uh, can, can you tell us more about the involvement of that My Way bus? We're looking at pictures that were provided to us from Chopper 24. Um, and can you tell us where this little girl was when she was struck by the bus? Yeah, so obviously uh, some of the specifics here are subject to change as the investigation unfolds. But what we think we know in terms of sequence event of events at this point is that that uh, transit bus was traveling southbound on uh, Lisgar Street. Uh, and the uh, the child, the girl, uh, was crossing the street. At the time, you, as you can imagine, uh, 2.30 being that school is let out, uh, there's a substantial vehicular and pedestrian traffic in the area. It's a very busy spot. Uh, at this at this time, based on witness reports, uh, there's no information to suggest that uh, the uh, the driving behavior uh, of the of the bus driver was outside of normal. Uh, and uh, it looks right now that uh, that the the child did attempt to uh, to cross the street in front of the path of the of the bus. Unfortunately, that's awful to hear, Tyler. One thing just to wonder it, from the standpoint of either Peel or from the police standpoint, or maybe this would go to the school. Is there going to is there any um, uniformed rank and file police officers that are used in terms of trauma and grief counseling here? Because you have a lot of other children that may have been traumatized by something like this. Well, so certainly. We have, of course, uh, uh, divisional mobilization uh, officers uh, that uh, work closely with schools as required. That being said, the school board themselves uh, have uh, 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 resources available to ensure grief counseling as well. Obviously, this is a traumatic scene, uh, seeing a, a potentially seeing your friend struck by a bus as well uh, as all the, the police investigation. It is, is, it is quite something. It is, it is for adults, let alone children. So I can imagine over the next, uh, the next few days that those resources will be made available to the students through the school board. Yeah, and, and while we have you here, Constable, I want to talk about road safety because it's a big night for a lot of kids. They're going to be hitting the streets, if not now, then just a couple minutes from now. Um, what is your advice to parents and children on this Halloween? Well, listen, uh, today kids got one thing on their mind, rightfully so, and that's trick-or-treating, and there's going to be lots out there uh, to, to be had this evening. We're reminding motorists to please slow down and be uh, mindful of the fact that there is going to be more kids out than usual tonight, uh, especially on these side residential streets where lighting is not the best. Please keep in mind that that's, that's, that's what's happening tonight. And uh, for the grown-ups, all right, those that are, uh, uh, are, are participating in Halloween festivities and going out to parties tonight, uh, all the all the power to you. We want you to have fun, but please, tonight of all nights, it's never okay to drink and drive, but please plan ahead and make sure you're drinking responsibly. There's lots of people, lots of kids out that are just looking to have some fun. We would hate for something tragic to happen. Constable, we appreciate your time. Constable Tyler Bell Moreno with the Peel Regional Police. Thank you again, sir. Thanks so much. Well, the province's police watchdog is investigating after a 17-year-old boy died in an exchange of gunfire with York Police in Aurora last night. And for more, we're going to bring in our crime analyst, Steve Ryan, to help break down what we know and also reaction that we have thus far. Steve. Yeah, Andrew, uh, Downey Circle is the uh, quiet residential street, according to neighbors in that uh, area, um, that was anything but last night. Now, that street is just north of where we are now at York Regional Police Headquarters. SIU tell us that at 7.30 last night, York Regional Police responded to a break and enter in progress. When they arrived on scene, um, they were met by a 17-year-old who was armed. There was a gunfire exchange between the police and between that 17-year-old, and the 17-year-old died as a result. And now the SIU has invoked their mandate because, of course, anytime there's an interaction between a civilian and the police and where death occurs or serious bodily harm, the SIU invoked their mandate, and their job is to critique the actions of the police to see if, in fact, they were well within their rights, within the law, to use uh, the lethal force that they use to deal with the situation that they were confronted with uh, last night. Uh, we spoke with a resident in that neighborhood earlier on today, and here is some of that conversation. Let's have a listen. It was quite loud, echoing everywhere, um, and then our neighbors started calling us, wondering if they could get back in in our neighborhood. Um, they were at work across the street and weren't allowed to enter. Um, we heard gunshots for quite a little bit, um, probably around like five minutes-ish of time. And, um, and then I started to see stretchers get pulled out um, and a body was taken away. Now, I just watched an interview that our colleague John Musselman uh, conducted. He, of course, is with our sister station, CTV, and uh, he spoke with a witness who said that the 17-year-old was walking down the street firing at the police as they arrived on scene. The witness said that the police made demands uh, that this uh, person, the 17-year-old, drop his uh, firearm. Uh, he did not do so, so gunfire was exchanged. Now, that is part of police training when they are confronted with a threat. They 
make demands of that uh, perceived threat to instruct that person what to do, which is to drop the firearm, but it also creates witnesses. And in this particular case, this seems to be what has happened here. The police were shouting at this person to drop the firearm, uh, the shotgun, and uh, he did not do so. And by the police making those commands, they were able to attract the attention of witnesses uh, in that neighborhood. And the uh, witness that the John spoke with uh, has key information that I'm sure has already been passed on to the special investigations unit. Send it back to you guys. All right, Steve Ryan reporting live for us from Aurora tonight. Steve, thanks so much for this. 537, 23 degrees. It's Halloween. A lot of kids are hitting the streets, and it's going to be a busy night in terms of traffic. Lots to keep an eye uh, out for. If you are a driver, Adjuancia Abois, keeping a close eye on conditions. How's it looking out there, Ed? Yeah, you know, we are dealing with a few issues, Alina, that are impacting the drive. So we'll start on the southbound lanes of the 410. It's a little bit of a hindrance for uh, parents trying to get home to get their trick-or-treaters ready. But this is on the southbound lanes of the 410, uh, just as you make your way in the approach to the 401. It's the HOV as well as the left lane. That is out with this collision. Here's another look at this uh, collision. It is really, really backing up the drive as you make your way on the approach. Also problems in Timilton. Had a little bit of a situation. A couple of vehicles involved in a uh, collision. It's westbound on the 401. This is a James Snow Parkway. HOV as well as the left lane is out. And the Gardner continues to be a busy place as you make your way into and out of the downtown core. But fingers crossed, no collisions. But we saw that long-term construction, which continues. Outside of camera view problems, if you're traveling just a bit north of on northbound on the 400 up in King at town line. It is uh, the HOV in the left lane block to the collision. So it's shaping up to be a busy Halloween evening. I'll send it back to you both. Thanks very much. Adjua. Well, I know that the haters won't have anything to okay. hate about here. I'm so, you know what? We, well, the I don't haters are going to hate, 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 right? Yeah, and I only have so many Taylor Swift <laughs> references, so I'm going to use that one again. But uh, hey, she's it's coming to good. town, did you know? Yeah, uh, it's all for her ta Taylor Swift era tour. Taking over Toronto next month, CB24's Beatrice Baseman joins us live uh, with the very latest. What did you think? Okay, no, not impressed. Okay, fair enough. Fair I enough. guess I'm the anti-hero of this one. All. Okay, I got one more. One more. Oh, I've heard every single one of these multiple times today. I mean, the press conference with city officials, and I get it was all in good fun as they were trying to get the hype up even more, if that's even possible, for the uh, Taylor Swift era's tour coming. Uh, I think we've used up all of the song lyrics officially now, so just shake it off, will you? But I'm bummed. No. Uh, so November 14th, 15th, and 16th, you'll see Taylor Swift here for the first uh, three of these six sold-out shows. And then the 21st, the 22nd, and the 23rd, she'll be here as well. Uh, obviously, the fans are going to be excited. They'll be thronging to the Rogers Centre, though there is no fan zone right here. And you're being asked, if you don't have a ticket, don't actually come and congregate here near the stadium. You just won't be allowed to. There's going to be security in place to prevent that from happening. Uh, certainly, 500. 100,000 people is a lot, and that's what Destination Toronto is expecting when it comes to fans actually descending on our city for this tour. With that many people comes hopefully a whole lot of spending as well. People are, are saying that uh, the city officials are saying that the Swifties not only stay for a while, but they spend quite a bit of money as well. So great for Toronto's economy, great for putting Toronto on the map. And the city says one of its main goals here is to show off some of uh, Toronto's key cultural aspect, the cultural performers. The poets will also be out in Nathan Phillips Square and along Taylor Swift Way in line with the tortured poets department records. So it's, there's all a theme here, but the biggest theme the city wanted people to know today, be safe and have fun. Here's more. We don't book um, major acts in this city, but we do want to be a city that attracts them. And it is um, a huge credit to Toronto to uh, be hosting uh, six concerts of, of an of a artist of the caliber that Taylor Swift is. As you also heard, uh, this is not our first time uh, preparing to host and manage large scale events. And we want to continue to strengthen that capability. Well, the economic impact numbers are very, very impressive. So in terms of total impact on gross domestic product, we're anticipating $282 million. That is driven by $152 million in direct spending. And notably, again, we expect of that spending, fully 93% will be dollars brought into this market by visitors coming here to Toronto. And the vast majority of those visitors coming in from outside of the city, city officials saying they're talking to municipalities and cities across the world where this tour has already happened, learning as much as they can because in 15 short days, the Queen, Taylor Swift, will be here 
for all of us to enjoy. And traffic's going to be bad, too, by the way. Back to you guys. Yeah. That's <laughs> Although, didn't I hear that Taylor Swift, there's just going to be construction stopped because of Taylor Swift? It's the Taylor Swift effect. All right, Beatrice Faceman reporting live. Thanks so much. 542, 23 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. The Ford government is preparing to remove sections of bike lanes on major city streets. We'll tell you where and get your reaction next. Welcome back. The Ford government is getting ready to begin removing sections of bike lanes on major streets. Bloor, Young, and University Avenue. Yeah, and for the latest on this, let's go live to CB24's Lindsay Biscaya. Already there's been a lot of reaction, Lindsay. Yes, there is a lot of reaction to this. As we know by now, this is a pretty contentious issue when it comes to bike lanes in the city of Toronto. But these are the latest developments today after that legislation was passed last week by the Ford government, uh, where basically municipalities across Ontario will have to get permission from the province to build bike lanes that would interfere with lanes of traffic for vehicles. The province now also has uh, permission mission to go back and look at bike lanes and infrastructure for cycling that was built within the last five years and deem whether they should remove it or not. And so the latest developments today is that the Ford government, as you both mentioned, has begun the process of removing certain sections of bike lanes on some busy routes, Bloor, Young and University Avenue. So for more on this, as you mentioned, reaction, we're getting more reaction today. Uh, I'm joined now by Trevor Townsend, founder of Keep Toronto Moving. Uh, it's good to have you, sir. Thanks so much for taking the time. My pleasure. Nice so, to be here. Your initial reaction to these latest developments? It's fantastic. Uh, look, at uh, I think anybody who lives and commutes in Toronto right now understands that the introduction of bike lanes on our most congested and busiest arterial roads has been an unmitigated disaster. And so uh, taking bike lanes off of our arterial roads and moving them onto side streets only makes sense. It's good for cyclists. It's good for getting congestion resolved. And um, I think good on the Ford government for stepping in and, uh, and taking control of this disastrous situation we're dealing with. Do you really believe, I mean, so that was going to be my next question, because, of course, the premier tweeted today, you know, bike lanes should be on secondary streets, as you mentioned as well. Uh, they should be on side streets. It, it, do you think we should be building more bike lanes on side streets to have connecting routes throughout the city? Well, I think the question is, you know, if you look at the census data, the organization I set up a couple of years ago was called Keep Toronto Moving. We went and we looked at the actual raw data that was produced on transportation by uh, the Canadian Statistics Canada in 2011, 2016 and 2021. And the number of commuters that actually travel to work uh, on their bicycles is 2%. The typical, this is going, that's, this is not my data, this is census, the census data over those three periods. And the typical commute time is under 15 minutes. And so we're talking about in very urban areas, people who are using bike lanes for relatively short commute times. And so absolutely, there's, there's a place for cyclists on our roads and keep Toronto moving. Uh, we have a terrific website, keeptorontomoving.ca, which explains some of the real data out there that's not being reported. Uh, we believe that cyclists, uh, there's lots of room for cyclists on, on our streets, just not on the major arterial roads in our city. Okay, unfortunately, we are already out of time. Trevor Townsend, founder of Keep Toronto Moving, really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. My pleasure. So there you go, Lena uh, and Andrew. We did reach out to the Minister of Transportation today for comment because he did release a statement that says 1.2% of people commute by bike. But as you just heard there, I did get those numbers from Trevor Townsend. He sent me the data, 2% of people commute by bike. Uh, and we did reach out for comment, but the Minister of Transportation declined to comment today. But we do know he's going to be speaking with reporters tomorrow, so I'm sure this is far from over. Back to you. Yeah, could be just the beginning there. Uh, Lindsay, thanks so much for this. It's 548, 23 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. And this is Halloween. 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 Okay, I don't know if I can do that one again. No tricks, we swear. We're going to come back with a treat when we return. Do not go anywhere. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour or the trick-or-treating hour is close at hand. <laughs> Creatures crawl in search of candy and terrorize y'all's neighborhood. And speaking of one neighborhood, let's bring in <laughs> CJ Lou from East York, joining us now with more and possibly some candy. <laughs> 
That was great, Andrew. I mean, you really set the mood for what's happening here in East York. So in about 10 minutes, that is when the sun is going to set. It's when all the ghosts are coming out and it's when all the kids are going to come out, but it's already starting to get busy. And I mean, this holiday is all about the kids and their costumes and talk about variety here. Uh, so tell me about your costume. What are you? I'm a LOL doll. Why did you choose to be an LOL doll? Because I really like them. Yeah. Well, you look wonderful. And what about you? What are you? I'm a minion. Minion? Uh, give me your best impersonation of a minion. Hello. <laughs> very, very good. Just like them. And wow, talk about scary. Uh, who are you guys? We're Grim Reapers. Yeah, um, we have uh, glowing eyes too. Yeah. Oh, they glow. Wow. If you press the button at the back. Yeah. Very nice. Um, yeah. And this this has got to be a favorite too, especially for Leafs fans. Uh, what are you? I'm the Stanley Cup. I'm Who, the Stanley Cup. You are the Stanley Cup. Oh, wow. First time we're seeing it here in a long time. Uh, tell, tell me how, how you made this costume or who did it? I didn't make it. My sister did. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of styrofoam. Yeah. Yeah. So how are you guys feeling about Halloween? It is absolutely beautiful outside. Yeah. Um, feeling good. Want to go get some candy? Yeah. 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 Yum, yum. Yum, yum. Well, we'll let them go ahead and do that. Uh, it's about to get real busy here. I'm here on East York, up Browning Avenue, and I'm told this is one of the most popular streets to go trick-or-treating at. You see the decorations, you see adults dressed up too. Uh, just overall, such a great time, and people really come from all over the GTA to come get their candies here. But for now, we'll send it back to you guys. Um, it's about oh, to really pick up over here. Love love the costumes. Love, love your costume, Yeah, Chisija. Super Sija. And I just want to mention, it's feeling like 28 out there, really warm this, this evening. This is a great time to go trick-or-treating, maybe. Maybe. Well, speaking of trick-or-treating, uh, a dental clinic in Mississauga will be hosting a candy buyback program this weekend where kids can trade in their leftover treats in exchange for a little bit of cash. For more, we are joined by Dr. Mahmoud Manzour, a principal dentist at M-City Dental. We appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. I guess Thank the you first, guys for having me. Oh, we ha well, we had to have you because you're going to take kids candy away. Tell us why. <laughs> so ideally, what we're trying to do is we're trying to promote dental health in the community and awareness and tell p children that, you know, there's not a bad option. You can have candy and at the same time, there's better options as well and you can do better. So, so just to be clear here, the message is you can still enjoy your treats mm -hmm. on a night like this, right, Doc? Absolutely. But moderation <laughs> is the key. We don't want you to eat all your candy at one night, have a small portion day after day, and the rest you can bring to me and I can give you cash. Okay, so how does that buyback uh, program work? What, what's that going to look like? So ideally, for every pound of chocolate or candy that you bring me, I'm going to give you guys $2. And then we're going to donate that chocolate or candy to the, to the food bank. And just so you were talking before, uh, Dr. Menzor, about when and, uh, you know, making this sort of like a sometimes food, as Elmo would put it. Mm. When and how should people have candy if it's going to be in moderation? Should you have it after dinner? When should you be brushing your teeth? Can you help us make sure we don't get cavities? <laughs> Absolutely. So you can have it... After dinner would be a good time, you know, you don't want to spoil your dinner. But at the same time, don't brush your teeth immediately after. I would say drink water. It's going to reduce the acidity in your mouth because 30 minutes after eating candy or eating in general is when the acidity is the highest and you're at the most risk. So wait 30 minutes, then brush your teeth. All right, some sound advice. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud Manzoor, principal dentist at M-City Dental. Thanks so much for this and happy Halloween. You as well. Have a great day. Enjoy the festivities. It's oh, 556, <laughs> 23 degrees. I know Andrew will. Uh, you're watching Live at 5. The largest indoor agricultural and equestrian showcase in the world is nearly here. We're going to take you to the Royal Winter Fair next. The largest indoor agricultural and equestrian showcase in the world about to kick off in Toronto. The Royal Agricultural Winter Fair begins tomorrow at Exhibition Place. The event is in its 102nd year and attracts 300,000 visitors annually. It's a 10-day celebration of the best in Canadian food, livestock and horsemanship. It is the year of camelid, which is an alpaca or a llama or a camel. Um, but these two especially have the perfect demeanor to welcome our guests to the fair. And they really like coming to unusual situations and they're here to trick or treat. 
All right, this is Toronto's Breaking News, CP24. Thanks for watching. Happy Halloween, everybody. CCP News at 6 is next.